Hello. Pujari Gamaru. My name is Erin. And I'm the citizen science program lead in ALA. Thanks very much for your interest in attending the first of ALA speaker series for 2021. Today, we have three great speakers who are all administering citizen science projects in the disaster response resilience space. Before we begin, I wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're all meeting from today. For me, I acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of this place we now call Sydney. Let me know where you're dialing in from via the chat function. First, some quick housekeeping and information on how the session will run. The session will be recorded and I'll introduce each of the three speakers in approximately 10 minutes followed by a question and answer period. On the right hand side of your screen, there is both a chat function and a question button. We have lots of time set aside for questions, so I really encourage you to pose your questions in this section throughout. If you want to change your view of the slides or the speakers, there is a small button at the bottom of your screen with a person on it. This changes the size of what is being displayed. At the end of the session, there will also be a quick poll with a few questions that would be great if you could fill out before you drop off the call. So citizen science is advancing rapidly, especially over the past 10 years. With a real uptick of interest during the 2019-20 bushfires and during COVID. However, citizen science is not new. Science at its foundations built on amateur expertise with the aim of moving discovery forward. What is new with citizen science is that it challenges the structures of science and strives for greater inclusion of people, knowledge, and questions. The future of citizen science will be expanding and learning across disciplines as I suspect the need for human-centered design comes much more into the fore. In the disaster resilience space, citizen science is of huge relevance to the Atlas of Living Australia. As from January last year, the ALA, in collaboration with colleagues, responded to the global community's interest in playing a part in Australia's bushfire response. Over the course of the year, we put some resources in place to help our communities contribute. These efforts included national forums that brought together key stakeholders to explore how the citizen science sector could be supported and coordinated to help deliver research-ready data in the bushfire space. And the forums resulted in the development of formal recommendations that are used to support continuing discussions with government and key stakeholders. We also partnered with the Australian Citizen Science Association to establish the Bushfire Project Finder. This resource is to assist the search for vetted citizen science projects that can contribute to our understanding of post-fire bushfire recovery. Currently, there are 33 projects listed in the project finder, and many projects have already published papers outlining their findings, thereby demonstrating how citizen science is having an impact in post-fire recovery. Projects such as the Australian Museum's Frog ID and UNSW's Environment Recovery Project are great examples of projects that have already published early results. We also set up about promoting the impact of citizen science, and we profiled the results of a project running on the DigiBell platform to search for evidence of the Kangaroo Island Dunnock post-fire. And we also co-wrote a piece in the conversation focused on citizen science and bushfire recovery in partnership with the then chief scientist, Dr. Alan Finkel, providing further examples of successful projects and recommendations of how to augment the efforts further. And finally, we just wrapped up a blog series where we outline the ways citizen scientists can help scientists prepare for and understand extreme events. In the series, we profile projects that can help establish a baseline of understanding and also ones that monitor conditions during an event. In the final blog, we provided instructions on how citizen scientists can create their own projects and provided links to standards and principles we helped develop to ensure best practice design and implementation. And we're just getting started. Our work and commitment to make it easier for citizen scientists to contribute research-ready data to help inform disaster response and recovery is really starting to kick off. And we're keen to help facilitate genuine partnerships between communities and researchers to fully leverage citizen science in Australia, which is one of the reasons behind the webinar today. So without further delay, I'll introduce you to the first guest speaker, Dr. Patrick Norman who is a research scientist for the Griffith Climate Change Response Program at Griffith University. He specializes in assessing human impacts to the environment 
particularly through remote sensing and volunteer geographic information. His research is now focused on assessing broad scale spatial impacts to forests, including from fire. And Patrick is one of the researchers working on the development of the bushfire recovery project. Over to you, Patrick. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here. And I'm glad, really hope everyone enjoyed watching my talk today. And I'm sure we've got some great speakers coming up. So I'll just start sharing my slides. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting work that we've been doing around the Black Summer mega fires, um, mainly concentrated on the East Coast fires, so not so much of Kangaroo Island and the Stirling Range ones. Um, but firstly, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the tradi various traditional owners of where we all meet today, um, and in particular the Kumbameri, Mananjali and Wangarabara peoples of the Uganda region. I'd like to acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging. So. This big project, our um, citizen science components, a smaller part of a really large project that we've been doing um, in conjunction with other uh, researchers from Griffith University, along with from ANU and the Greatest Thin Ranges. Um, so the project in total has been focused on the really uh, assessing the bushfires, but really looking at what the scientific evidence um, around um, at what caused the bushfires and making sure that we provide the public and policymakers with the latest up-to-date scientific information. So this has really been mainly concentrated around a series of reports that we've done, example of one on the left, um, but all of these reports, as well as some citizen science information and some interactive maps are available on bushfirefacts.org, if any of you can are interested and wanna follow this up. Um, so our citizen science project is a bit of a beta test. So we've, what we're doing is getting people, um, we're hoping to get people out into the field to look at the forest, to see how it's recovering um, and to relay some information back to us so we can combine it with spatial analyses to see if we can validate some of our other methods, as well as getting people engaged with these burnt communities, particularly, um, especially when there was a lot of uh, talk about all the forest being dead and making sure that we have uh, people are still getting out there and seeing what how Australian forests behave after fire. So our citizen science component um, has been really focused on two working groups, and it's been mainly focused on the south coast of New South Wales around Batemans Bay. So we've been, because it's just a trial, we've just used a, a ready-made platform to collect the data. And this is the Nest Forms app, just if anyone has used it. It was just a really easy way to get a series of forms, as well as being able to easily gather geolocation data and allows people to post up images of these sites. So it was just a really neat little way to get hold of the data. But uh, if we, in order to expand this, we'll have to um, build a full platform. So before sending people out into the field to collect data, we, we made a series of forms. So it's had a range of questions and, um, and provided a lot of people with some keys and information about how to correctly gather the citizen science data. So these questions included um, site characteristics, such as what was the vegetation type of the site that they were in? Um, what's the landscape position? So if they're on a ridge or in a gully, um, the vegetation development stage. So this is, it seems a little bit confusing, but this is really just, is it old growth? Is it, you know, freshly uh, new regrowth after being cleared or is it post logging? Um, but really what we're interested in is that burn severity and forest recovery aspects. So we provided a series of images and keys to allow the users of the app to actually say, oh, well, this is uh, a high severity burn. And we really did this to just maintain consistency within our, um, our sampling. We also provided the option for people to post up pictures of the fo um, photos of the forest, just so we could cross validate what the forest was actually looking like and also gave people the opportunity to um, record and take photos of any animals that they've seen in the forest which um, helps to engage you know people while they're out there and so just to um, show some early results so we've from about 230 records um, of these 215 were found to be valid um, and useful for us uh, it's the results are starting to show um, aspects that we were hoping for. 
as far as the eucalypt forest with the shrubby understory burnt at a higher severity than rainforest in the eucalypt forest with the wet wetter understories, which um, which is to be expected, especially from the scientific literature. This this is um, the way. So you can see all of our different vegetation communities on the right. Uh, similar findings were also found um, with the stand age of the forest that people were in and showing that the older growth forests burnt at a less severe rate than those younger forests, which is excellent. So this helps to validate our, our findings and it means that we're, um, we're really happy with how this process has gone and then we're going to try and upscale it to a, in the future. So just to kind of take a step back, and to show you the bushfirefacts.org website, along with an interactive map that we've made combining some of the remote sensing data with some of the citizen science records. I'll just show you a little video. Hopefully this all goes smoothly. I didn't um, want to go through the, the website live because uh, just in case it was a bit jittery. So this is our homepage. It's, um, it's got a bit of our media. It's got a background of our, of our project. And if you scroll right down to the bottom, it has um, the reports, but they can also be found in the project tab at the top. We also have fact sheets about each of the aspects of the fires. But if you go up to the top tab and look at fire maps, this is where we've made this little interactive map. Um, so it gives a little bit of a background. And also that bottom paragraph is just a little bit important, just in case the map hasn't pulled up correctly. Generally, I find just a simple refresh of the web page will sort any issues out, just in case any of you have any issues, if you're having a look at this later on. So on the panel on the left hand side, this is our interactive map and those colours are from our remote sensing analysis. So it shows the burn severity. So this is done using Google Earth Engine and a few other big remote sensing tasks, but those points are our citizen science records. So in this map, you can actually go on and filter those things, uh, the tabs, um, the panels on the right hand side to the points that you click on. So this can show up some of the data that we've collected from each of the sites and as well as the forest images that people have posted. So the neat thing is about this little, um, it's a power Microsoft Power BI application, but if you click on that little arrow, it brings up those images nice and big. So if you go back, if you're on this website, just click on any empty space and it'll bring back all the citizen science records. As you can see, most of the sampling attention has been on the Batemans Bay area on the south coast. We've had a little bit up in those higher area up around Canberra and the uh, higher areas of New South Wales, as well as a few just north of um, Newcastle. Um, but as you can see, we can also expand on some of those wildlife images that powerful owls are wonderful sighting, especially in amongst those burnt landscapes. Um, but the, the main, I don't know, the take home of it is the, this forest images. So this is each of the sites, how they're looking at that time of sampling. And you can really kind of get a feel to what these the citizen scientists were actually looking at when they were sampling this area. So that's really important for us to help validate that information later on. So that's the end of my little video. Um, and so our future expansion that I've just mentioned, really we want to be able to get this out to the general public and we want to get everyone out there to have a look at the forest. We're hoping to expand that remote sensing analysis to not only how it's burnt at the time, but actually assess how the forest is recovering, particularly in some of those areas that were really badly burnt. Um, so in order to do this, we're going to have to build our own specific task specific app, but we've got some builders at Griffith University who we've contacted who are well ahead of it and will help us out in that. And we'd really love to expand this citizen science effort, not just focusing on the south, uh, south coast of New South Wales, but into Gippsland, northeast New South Wales and into southeast Queensland. Um, that's my app. Uh, that's my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I think we're doing questions in a little bit. Thanks. Thank you so much, Patrick. I can see the, the questions rolling in. Um, so keep thinking about them. I'll introduce our next speaker. Talia Perry, Perry has recently finished her PhD at the University of Adelaide, where she combined her passions in molecular biology and public outreach to aid in conservation and captive breeding of the iconic short-beaked echidna. 
During her PhD, Talia created and continues to run the Australia-wide citizen science project Echidna CSI. This project has engaged thousands of the general public to submit echidna sightings and scat material in order to gain unprecedented insights into wild echidna populations across the country. Over to you, Talia. Thanks so much, Erin. All right, let me share my screen. Okay. All right, we're up and running. So, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'd like to firstly acknowledge the Ghana people whose land I'm on today. Um, as Erin very nicely introduced, my name is Talia and I um, have just recently finished my PhD, but I'm still researching in the same um, area that I was previously. So, very luckily, uh, my supervisor had some money to give me, which is really nice. Um, so uh, I'm primarily from a genetics background um, and for the past years have been studying echidnas and finding ways to better aid in their conservation um, by combining multiple areas of science and engagement together. So today I'll be talking about the work that we have just started on bushfire assessment um, by combining citizen science and microbiome work. So echidnas are incredibly unique animals and so let me tell you a little bit about them first. The short-beaked echidna is one of only three surviving uh, monotremes alongside the long-beaked echidna and the platypus. Monotremes are incredibly unique as they are the only mammals to lay eggs. And this group split from the other two groups of mammals, the eutherians and the marsupials, approximately 187 million years ago, making monotremes the oldest surviving mammalian lineage. Echidnas have adapted very well to the Australian climate. Uh, they are able to inhabit all types of environments, even from the extremes of the desert all the way to the snow. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> echidnas are incredibly difficult to find in the wild. And so we actually have very limited understanding about most wild populations. The only well-studied echidna population is on Kangaroo Island here in South Australia. And research for more than 30 years has now resulted in that uh, population being listed as endangered. So we are very concerned about echidnas across the rest of the country because they face the same threats as echidnas do on Kangaroo Island. In order to answer a lot of questions very quickly, um, we needed to gain as much data and material as quickly as possible, which requires more innovative approaches than we were currently using for echidna research. And so to do this, we used a citizen science approach to gather Australia-wide data uh, and material of echidnas and created the project called Echidna CSI. Uh, Echidna CSI has now been running for just over three years. We created a phone app so that the public could submit sightings of echidnas whenever they saw them. And also we asked people to collect echidna poo for us or uh, nicely named scat instead. <laughs> uh, Echidna CSI has worked remarkably well. We've now um, got over 10,000 participants uh, across the whole of Australia who have provided us with almost 11,000 sightings now, which is the most sightings that we've ever been able to achieve over that three year period for echidnas. And people have also submitted us over 500 echidna scats. So you might be wondering why we ask for scats and there is a good reason. We're not just getting people to collect poo for no reason. Um, and that is because, like I said, I'm from a genetics background. So we actually get a lot of really interesting DNA and hormone molecules um, out of echidna scats and out of animal scats, any animal scat um, really. So these techniques can be applied to any animal of your choosing. So from an echidna perspective, from the DNA, we can get information about the food that they're eating. We can get information about how echidnas are related to each other. We can get the DNA from the bacteria living in the guts, which is a really good indication of health. Um, and from hormones, we can look at stress and even reproduction. And the great thing about running this through in conjunction with Echidna CSI means that we get all of these samples from completely different populations across Australia, um, and uh, which means that we can then start to assess how these different populations compare and different, differ to each other. So I'm going to focus today on this microbiome aspect of our, our study. Microbiome research has really exploded in the, uh, in, since 2007 when the Human Microbiome Project was um, published in Nature. And since then, um, it's been recognised that microbiome research is also a really important aspect of wildlife and conservation um, for, for animals as well. So we know, we're now aware that the gut microbiome plays a really crucial role in animal health, including 
uh, things like defending from pathogens, um, breaking down food, and even being involved in the immune system. So one of our major aims with Echidna CSI and with collecting these scats was to characterize the Echidna gut microbiome, um, which has never been done for the species before. So luckily, because uh, people were so enthusiastic about collecting Echidna scats for us, um, in red here, these are all of the samples that we use in our first major study looking at characterizing the Echidna gut microbiome. So as you can see, um, they spread far and wide across Australia. So this is, these are samples that we would never have been able to achieve as a research group on our own. And they also cover all of the different types of climate zones um, and vegetation types across Australia too. Um, we also were lucky enough to actually get a lot of samples from both Perth Zoo and Taronga Zoo, which allowed us to also compare not just the wild echidnas, but also echidnas in captivity and who are being fed across different types of diet. So echidna diets in captivity are quite different to what you would see in the wild rather than foraging for insects. They're sort of given this um, mush type food, which is mostly um, meat based. So we wanted to see whether the, um, whether the gut microbiomes were different because of that. So we were able to characterize the um, gut microbiome in echidnas, which gave us a lot of really interesting information about their biology and their diet, um, which I won't go into huge detail here now, but essentially we saw that there is an incredible amount of diversity across Australia. Um, and interestingly, interestingly enough, um, we saw a lot of plant fermenting bacteria. So this is giving us better information about um, diets in echidnas as well, which is still a very lacking um, uh, part of echidna biology um, and it looks like plants are actually a, quite a major um, presence in their, in their diet, which we also have some other genetic um, data that backs up this um, microbiome evidence as well. And we also were able to characterize these um, echidna uh, microbiomes from the zoo held animals and we saw a very dramatic shift from the um, wild in comparison to the to the captive um, echidnas. So we're trying to now work closely with the zoos, um, in particular, Michelle Shaw, who's a nutritionist at Taronga Zoo, in order to maybe help develop some better diets that would better reflect the, um, the wild samples. So now moving on, that the, the fact that we have all of this background information about echidna microbiomes as a really broad perspective, we wanted to then develop um, information about how the bushfires may have affected echidna gut microbiomes and also their diet too. So we all are very aware of the mega fires in 2019 and 2020 um, that devastated a huge amount of the Australian landscape. The map here shows in yellow the, um, the burnt areas and in red are the sightings of echidna that we've collected through echidna CSI. So you can certainly see that we have a quite a lot of overlap in, um, in range of and habitat of where echidnas are located. So um, echidnas are actually quite well adapted to fires um, in Australia. And uh, there is someone who actually made a very lovely cartoon to explain this. Um, their name is uh, Anatomica Science. So essentially echidnas will uh, dig underground when they sense a fire coming um, and go into this sleep-like state, which is known as torpor. Sometimes echidnas don't bury far enough. And so then the, when the fire goes across them, they unfortunately get seared. And this cartoon was actually created in response to this uh, sort of semi-viral photo that came out of Echidna CSI where someone had submitted this one from these mega fires, but a, a different fire, where we, we actually saw this incredible burn right across um, the echidna spines and we see melting going down the spines as well. So this echidna was um, uh, called up for wildlife rescue. So I think it is healthy and fine now, but um, that's quite a dramatic dramatic shift. So we wanted to see, even though echidnas can survive bushfires, um, we wanted to see what exactly happens in terms of their health and their biology after these bushfires have occurred. So we decided to focus on Kangaroo Island again, um, and that's for several reasons. Um, firstly, we have Peggy Reese Miller, who both lives and works on Kangaroo Island. She is the world leading echidna ecologist and has been working quite closely with us for the past um, several years. So having her expertise and having someone who was already assessing the echidnas post bushfire was really important to us. We also have a very large participant base on Kangaroo Island and that's um, also helped by Peggy because she has um, created this love of echidnas for her local community as well. So because of that, we actually have a really good understanding of how of echidnas 
and a lot of data and material from echidnas um, prior to the bushfires. So since 2017, people have been sending us um, sightings and scats from Kangaroo Island, which means that we have this before fire um, sample and data to pull from. Pull from. So getting into this um, data, um, we this is at Kangaroo Island and shaded in this grey is the burnt areas. Um, this is just a very preliminary um, uh, study, so we'll have to definitely expand this in the future. But in green, we have um, two locations where we got samples for from for before the fires. There was three samples from both these locations. And then in the orange, these are the locations of the stats that were collected after the bushfires. So we have a couple that were immediately in the bushfire affected zones. We've got a few that were close by, and then we've got one that was much further east. Um, Honestly, going into this, we weren't exactly sure what we were going to find. Because there was such a high amount of diversity in the wild samples um, from the previous study, um, we weren't sure if we were going to see a, a specific signature, but we were blown away by how strong the signature was for these um, before and after bushfires. So what you can see here is essentially after we've started, an started analysing the microbiome, each of these um, dots represents one of the samples, and we see this very distinct clustering of the before fires and the after fires, except for this um, after fire sample here, and that is this sample over here. So what we think is happening is that even the samples that were collected outside of the bushfires, these are from echidnas who are likely foraging inside and outside of this area, so actually have a very similar signature to these samples that were found immediately inside of the bushfire affected area. Um, and wh whereas this sample here is the one that's clustering with the before fires, so because it's quite far away, this is unlikely to be foraging in those areas. So this is still super interesting that the samples that were collected outside areas um, shows us that echidnas are foraging inside and outside and are getting this specific burnt, um, burnt region uh, profile. So to look a little bit more deeply, um, don't be scared of these graphs, I will talk you through them. <laughs> Um, essentially, we have, uh, we're actually looking at the bacterial communities um, that were found in each of the samples. So each sample is represented by one of these bars, and we have here the after fires first and then the before fires here. And each of these colours is represented by one of the phyla of bacteria. And the proportion of these bars, the, the length of the bars are proportionate to how much of these bacteria were in them. So as you can see quite um, easily from this is that before fires we've got a dominating by proteobacteria um, and quite a significant amount of actinobacteria. These were the two most common or two of the most common um, bacteria phyla that were also seen in the previous um, studies as well from echidnas across Australia. But we see this dramatic shift in the after fires of Firmicutes actually being the most dominant followed by bacteriota. So um, just being able to look from this broader scale, we can see there's been this complete shift. Once we actually look a little bit deeper, um, so this is now looking at the, the bacteria at either a genus or a family level, depending on how well the, um, the sequences could be characterised. So it's a little bit uh, overwhelming, but um, essentially what we're seeing is that before fires, we had quite a lot of diversity between all of the samples. Um, whereas once, and no two samples are the same with, with these ones here, whereas once we get to the after fires, there's much more of the similar types of bacteria that we're seeing showing up over and over again. Um, what we also are seeing is that this Acinetobacter bacteria that is most common in the um, before fire samples is from soil, um, is a very common soil bacteria. So likely because of the fact that the topsoil is burnt um, across from the fires, this bacteria has been lost, which means that the echidnas are not actually ingesting that as they are foraging as well. Um, we're also seeing a lot more of uh, bacteriodes, which is like a gut, a gut commensal, um, but we're seeing a loss of this diversity here. And usually gut um, microbiomes are more diverse and more healthy an echidna is. So, um, there's still a lot that we need to dig into to find out what exactly these bacteria are doing functionally so that we can um, make some uh, some better um, outcomes from these these results. But essentially, um, we're seeing that from even just a very small sample size, we see this complete dramatic shift in the microbiome post fire. So that's something that has been completely new to us. 
By identifying this, we also see that echidnas are obviously foraging cross boundaries of the five boundaries. So that's super interesting to us too, to find out exactly how often they're crossing these boundaries. Um, and that means that there's probably a major diet shift too that we really need to be investigating. So this has sort of opened up a lot more questions than we actually had to begin with. So we're now interested in finding out what exactly these diet changes are, how quickly is this microbiome shift happening, um, can the diversity actually recover um, and if echidnas start feeding uh, back in the non-burnt areas? And also, is this um, something that we see in other fire-affected areas too? So even though, um, also even though that microbiome research is quite a large field now, I believe this is the first study to see how bushfires affect gut microbiomes for any animal. So this is super exciting research. Uh, there's still a lot to do in this space, but it will be really fascinating to see how this actually looked in other animals as well. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so Thank much, you. Talia. That was a real um, testament to the importance of baseline data for monitoring. So I'll introduce our, our final speaker for today. Dr. Mitchell Harley is a Ciencia Senior Lecturer in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of New South Wales. Mitchell is an expert in coastal erosion and how it impacts coastlines worldwide. His research entails the use of advanced coastal monitoring technologies to enhance our understanding of coastline change. In 2017, Mitchell founded the CoastSnap Citizen Science Beach Monitoring Program that is now established in 15 countries worldwide. Over to you, Mitch. Thanks so much, Erin. Uh, well, the, it's going to be a tough act to fire. What incredible uh, citizen science projects we have. I'd just firstly like to start by acknowledging where I am. I'm actually talking from the northern beaches of Sydney and acknowledge the Camaragal clan of the Eora Nation and pay my, my respect to elders past, present and emerging. So I'll just share my screen now. Second, bear with me. Okay, I hope you can see that. So um, I'm going to take you to the coastline now. Um, so it's been great seeing uh, about echidnas and, and uh, the bush. Um, so my, my laboratory is actually on the coast. Um, and as Erin was saying, I'm actually a coastal erosion researcher. Um, so why do we actually study the beach besides being a, a good excuse to hang out on the beach? Um, well. Australia is a fantastic laboratory for beach studies. There's um, an, over 11,000 beaches in, across Australia and a huge diversity of, coast, of, of beaches too. So in the Southern Hemisphere, we typically have what we call wave dominated beaches, beaches which are primarily exposed to these big waves from the Southern Ocean. And then in the North, we, we have less influence of waves and, and we, we call tide modified beaches with these really big tidal ranges. So a really good contrast of beaches all across Australia um, Australia is also, um, it's a coastal population. Um, so 85% of Australian population lives within 50, 50 kilometres of the coast. And we all love going to the beach. And finally, but beaches are actually under threat. So um, sea level rise and extreme storms are um, threatening the existence of our beaches. So we may not be able to enjoy them in the future. And, and um, yeah. Um, as everyone was saying, so I study coastal erosion and one of those things, one of my instruments of trade is actually video cameras. Um, so what we do for our research is that we install these video cameras up and down the coast um, wherever we can. Sometimes there's high rise um, apartment buildings, which we like to think of them as giant tripods where we can put our video cameras. And this, uh, this camera here is actually situated at Narrabeen Colorado Beach on, on the northern beaches. And it's been taking the same image of the beach every single, every 30 minutes for the past 15 years. And with these images, we can actually get incredible um, information of how much our coastlines vary over time. And it's particularly impressive during extreme storms. And one, one of them that we had, some of you may remember, was actually in 2016, where we had an extreme East Coast low storm um, and had that iconic image of the um, swimming pool end ending up on, on Colorado Beach. Well, I'm going to show you a new view of that storm itself from our video camera, because our video camera was actually located just above that swimming pool. And I'm going to play you a time-lapse video of basically 
all the images, it's just basically four days compressed into 20 seconds to show you how much change can, can happen within, within just the space of uh, four days during a storm. So this is the beach just before the storm arrived. And as you can see, a nice wide sandy beach, but then the storm hits. And as the storm waves get bigger and bigger, the storm progresses and the beach erodes. And pay, have a look on the left there, you can see a swimming pool. And there, that swimming pool uh, is undermined and ends up on the beach. So just in the space of four days, we, ha um, we had a erosion in excess of 50 metres. So the beach actually got 50 metres more narrow. We actually managed to um, get really good data from that event. We actually have our own twin engine airplane and we actually um, managed to scan the entire New South Wales coastline before and after that event. And what we found was an incredible 11.5 million cubic metres of sand was shifted from, from our beaches just from that, those four days alone, which is actually incredible. And if you think of the Melbourne cricket ground, that's equivalent to filling up the Melbourne cricket ground all the way to the brim with sand seven times over. So an incredible amount of sand that shifts during these extreme storms and um, just really shows how dynamic the, the coastline is. But it's also important to realise that coastlines are quite resilient. So this is a photo from our same camera station um, taken immediately after that storm event. And then let's have a look what happens one year from now. That's one year later. I'll just switch, go back and forth. And what you can see with that is that's entirely natural beach recovery. So the sand, it's important to recognise that sand is not lost from beaches, but it's just moved further offshore into deeper water. And over time with calmer conditions, the sand gradually returns to the beach um, naturally in most cases. So um, that's some of the research that we do. Um, these camera systems give us a whole lot of information, but they're quite expensive to install. Um, and as I said, there's over 11,000 beaches across all of Australia. Um, so we simply can't cover our beach monitoring alone. And, and that's why we've asked for the help of the community. And in 2017, we established um, the, the citizen science program called CoSNAP. And CoSNAP is a very simple idea, and it just involves installing these pieces of stainless steel, a camera cradle, overlooking uh, vantage points on, on, the, on the coastline, which there are many, we're blessed with many across Australia. And basically turn your, your uh, smartphone into a powerful beach monitoring device. So these camera, camera cradles basically fix the position and, and location of the um, photo. And so it ensure, enables that we're always getting the same photo through time. And next to these camera cradles, we have um, uh, some signs. We just provide some simple instructions about how to share it. And so there's, a, there's several ways. So we use social media, but also um, other ways as well, which I'll talk about. This is our Manly station on, on Sydney's Northern Beaches. And if you want to post on this, you can post to social media with hashtag CoSnapManly. So it's a very simple idea um, and, and all you need to do is take a photo. That's all you need to do. But there's actually a lot of sophisticated uh, technology that goes behind um, CodeNap. And the secret is actually in the photogrammetry. So photogrammetry is a um, well-known technique that has been applied for many years. And it basically supercharges your photos that you take. Um, so this is the photo of Manly. Um, it's a, regular photo, but what we actually do, we have these things called ground control points. So we actually, because um, it's the, the camera cradle is in a fixed location, we actually go out and measure the, that location, but also fix points within the image that we know. And that gives us a way to tie in um, your photos to, to the real world. And through some clever um, camera geometry, so if you think back to your mathematics, we are actually able to squish and squeeze all of these pixels around so that this oblique photo, so looking at it from an angle, actually becomes a bird's eye view. So that photo that you see, that bird's eye view is the exact same photo, but it's, it's been moved around so that it looks like it's been taken from space. 
And obviously, because it's not taken from space, what you see is the, those pixels in the distance, they start to smear out a little bit. But that means that we um, essentially have um, a, a photo of the beach that looks like a map. And, and, and what, what can we do with maps? We can measure things. And that's the next step of CoSnap is basically we use it to look at where the position of the shoreline is. So we have some algorithms that we've developed to map the shoreline position, which is basically the interface between sand and water. And we use that position to track how our coastlines are changing through time. Of course, an important element of this is the tides. And so we take in, also we take into account the tide level so that we know exactly what tide um, the, the photo was taken at and, and only compare uh, images from similar tide levels. So that's basically the, the nuts and bolts of what CoSnap does. And there's quite sophisticated um, technology behind that. Um, and we've actually done extensive measurements of um, how accurate this technique is. And we've, we've gone out at the same time and, and measured the shoreline. And we, what we find is that the, we can actually, just from your simple snap, we can measure the shoreline accurate to, to an um, accuracy of about two meters. And that's equivalent to almost to sending out a professional survey team to go and measure the beach. And all you need to do is take a snap. So that's, that's how CoSnap works. Um, thinking about um, this year alone, just to show you some results from CoSnap, um, 2020, we, we, we saw a lot of, we saw a lot of um, some talk, the talks about uh, f focusing on the tremendous bushfire damage. But we also have quite a lot, on the coast, it was also quite a, a very interesting year with some extreme storm events. So in February 2020, we had um, Stockton Beach, just near Newcastle on the New South Wales coastline, um, severely affected by erosion. In July of 2020, we had uh, some other extreme storms where um, houses at Womble Beach on the central coast of New South Wales were teetering on the edge and were at serious risk of uh, being claimed by the sea. And then Quite recently, we also had um, Byron Bay, where the, the entire main beach at Byron Bay seemed to be washed away. So um, with CoSnap, the idea is that at all these locations up and down the coast, when we have these extreme storms and over longer time, we can actually use your snaps to um, track how these, the amount of erosion that occurs and then importantly, how, how they, the beaches naturally recover as well and their, their resilience to these storm events over time. I'm going to show you um, some example of that. This is from our um, North Narrabeen station, Coast Snap station. You can see in the top left here, it's just the simple stainless steel camera cradle. Um, and this video that I'm going to show you is basically one year of photos um, taken from the station and applying our Coast Snap shoreline tracking technology to measure the beach change over time. And so pay attention to there's a big storm event that happened, that one that I showed in February last year, followed by the one in July, which also we saw those houses at Womble teetering on the edge. And we can use all these measurements just to track the long-term changes. And, and this data, data is incredibly valuable for us to manage our, to know how dynamic our coastlines are. Um, at North Nabbing, we've had a particularly uh, active community of engaged citizen science, scientists taking photos every day, going about their daily walk to, so we can get these incredible records. So I'll show this animation now. And you can see that storm. And then it starts to recover. And then more storm events. This is a very dynamic section of coastline. Um, it's, at, at, it's called an intermittently opening and closing lake and lagoon. So there's a lagoon entrance that it closes and opens, and you can see that all from these community photos. But importantly, so looking at our beach width that we can determine from our technology, we see that the beach width um, at the start was at the start was around 86 metres, um, but at the end um, was only 60 metres. So that, that 26 metres over the course of 2020 was lost, but actually never fully recovered by the end of the year. So 
we've also um, just had a new CoSNAP app, so please get involved and, and you can too become a citizen science and help monitor our CoScience. So download our CoSNAP app. Um, you can find that on all the app stores. Um, there's The good thing about the app is that there's actually a few ways now that you can contribute. So you, firstly, we have our um, um, CoSNAP beach monitoring stations where you can go and take your SNAP. But a new feature that we've developed is, is actually a do-it-yourself station. So we recognise that, you know, there's 11,000 beaches in Australia. Um, if you have a fence post or, or anything else that can control that position of your photo, um, go and use it. Go and if you're doing your daily walk, use that and you, you can set up your own station and record over time. Likewise, if you don't even have a fence post you, if you, and you just want to take regular photos always from the same vantage point, you can do that using our free roaming option. So there's a whole range of, of um, possibilities to get involved and, and the more data you have, uh, the better it is for us to understand our dynamic coastlines. Finding a lot, I'd just like to touch on, um, it's because it's such a simple idea um, and so powerful in terms of the information we get from it, it's, it's been very popular around the world, such that we now have over 100 CoSNAP stations worldwide in 16 different countries. So this is a map of um, where they are. We're on every single continent, almost except Antarctica. So it's, and that's just in three years alone. So from this technology, which began on the northern beaches of Sydney, we've, we've grown rapidly just in, in that time. And you can see all of our stations all across the world where this technology is now being applied. So I'd just like to end it there. I'd also like to just thank particularly the New South Wales Department of uh, Planning, Industry and Environment who initially supported this idea. And, and from those three, from that initial investment, we've been able to achieve so much. So thanks very much. Terrific. Thank you so much, Mitch. We've got a lot of questions coming through, so we better um, get to them. Mitch, I'm I'm interested, um, sometimes there's reluctance with citizen science in terms of um, the risk involved. Have you ever received any uh, pictures that weren't of beaches? Uh, yes, we do. I mean, <laughs> people, <laughs> when you work with social media, you're, you're inevitably working with a lot of people who'd like to take selfies or, or other things. Um, we actually have ways to deal with that though. So there's a whole abundance of AI technology now to immediately identify when a, when a photo is not a beach or when there's a person in front of the photo or something like that. So we can filter those out. Okay, great. Um, do you think it's a large percentage though overall? Look, it depends on, on the, on when we're working with the app, it's a very low percentage, almost zero because um, the, the people are identified and they have a personal account. On social media, it can be probably an uh, estimate about 30%. Okay. Well, super. All right, this next question is for all three of the presenters. Um, wondering if communicating research outcomes to citizen scientists is a core part of the project, and how do you manage this, if so? Um, Talia, do you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's definitely a very big part of how we run. We definitely understand that providing feedback to our participants is incredibly important with citizen science. So we do it through multiple avenues. Um, we have several different social media accounts um, across Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, which we post regularly at least once or twice a week. Um, we have an e-newsletter that we send out. So when everyone who um, downloads our app, we ask them to put their email to us. Um, so we have a um, an account uh, stock list of uh, our participants. So we always uh, send out some regular updates uh, through that every couple of months or so. And apart from that, um, uh, anytime we have a publication come out, we also try and share that as much as we can to everyone too. So it's definitely a large part of our project. And Patrick, I guess your project is just getting started. Yeah, um, we, we've been updating that interactive map and ensuring that, that that data kind of gets processed and shown regularly. But um, our whole project has been about communicating to the public um, aspects of the forest and how it's recovering and that science behind it. So uh, we haven't, or we, we're in close contact with the, the working groups that we've been collecting our citizen science data from. So they've been getting relayed information back, but we've 
um, definitely trying to integrate that output that they're generating and then showing it back on the website. Right, and Mitch? Yeah, it's a huge part of ours too. Um, so uh, one of the, the most valuable things is showing those time-lapse videos for us. Um, so we sharing them on Twitter, Facebook, so we've, um, Instagram, uh, all sorts of different social media channels. Um, and I think one of the things we have in, in, in the coastal space is, and I'm sure this probably applies elsewhere, is the, the concept of living memory. So people tend to forget these extreme events um, over time. I would, sometimes we argue that living memory could be as short as two years. Um, so having those those visual records of changes, I think, is very powerful to remind people of risk on the coastline of extreme storms that have gone by, and, and just to, and hopefully that then feeds into all aspects of society, how we plan our society, and so forth. Terrific. Patrick, the next question is for you. Uh, question about how you assure the GPS position, someone finds that their phone GPS almost always needs correction on certain applications. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's um, that's always an issue we have. We've been tracking it back to concentrating on trails. So we've been really watching where that location has, um, has been registered and make sure that it is actually on a trail because it's an easy way to kind of at least validate that it's uh, in, in one set of directions. I actually did my PhD on volunteer geographic information where people share up um, information about their tracks and locations. So I will um, had a good good bit of experience of dealing with those horrible uh, miss records of, of uh, people's posts. So I'll um, definitely be conscious of ensuring that that's not going to ruin any validation of our remote sensing data. Terrific. And Talia? A question about if you notice much change in before and after a composition of the diet of the kidna. In terms of the diet, we haven't actually got a lot of information on that yet. Um, so that's something that we're trying to move forward uh, with now. It's a little bit um, complicated with the kidnas because there's such limited information about exactly what their diet really consists of. They were initially, um, well, they still are really labeled as um, ant, ant and termite eaters exclusively, which is, we know is not true. Um, and we're starting to get more information that they're eating different types of beetles and insect larvae. Um, and now we're finding out that they're also eating fungus and plants as well. So um, to get that, type of information for, from every single scat sample is going to be a lot of work. And that's something that we're trying to start establishing now from the genetic techniques so that we can start actually matching up these um, samples to their microbiome specifically so that we can actually get some better information about that. So it's definitely a really big project that we're trying to start to get started now. Terrific. Mitch, the next question is for you. Um, while probably slower, could the same process be applied to monitor water course based erosion? Yeah, for sure. Um, if as long as you've got um, a clear edge between the water and the land, um, yeah, absolutely you can. Generally, we the technology works better when you have elevated locations to look over things. On 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 the coastline, we generally have, particularly in southeast Australia large headlands and, and great lookouts. Um, it works less well when you're just a few metres above above the water or on rivers, for instance. But So you could still do it, but you'd be limited to probably about a few hundred metres that you could monitor. That probably leads into this question, a um, bit of an extension. How do you monitor beach erosion on the tidal beaches in, in northern Australia, for example? Um, it's a little bit more of a challenge. Um, so on the tidal beaches, you have to, because the tidal beaches are generally a lot shallower gradients, they're a lot flatter, um, even small differences in water level in the tide can make huge, translate to huge differences on the land. Um, so what we have to do on those locations is pay particular close attention to getting the most accurate tide gauge records nearby the site. Um, and ensuring that the time of the photo actually absolutely corresponds to the time that actually it was recorded. Okay. Patrick, this next one's for you. It's about the, the communities that you use for your beta testing. 
Um, was the sampling effort random um, based on general community interests or did you target certain groups like land care um, in key areas or avoid bias? Uh, we used the, the GERS uh, Greatest and Ranges great network of connections for this. So we um, it was very much targeted on those locations um, around Batemans Bay, just because that area was so heavily hit and we were really targeting Monga and Murmurang National Parks, um, just to kind of get us a bit of a feel of what kind of data output we'll get from this. And uh, it was very much a close communication between who was going to access the app uh, and, and kind of not releasing it too broad and make sure that everyone who was doing it was well um, well versed in, in the sampling. And what are the timelines do you think that um, for the, the broader public to be involved in the project? Oh, we're hoping about midway through this year, or we're definitely hoping for this to kind of kick off. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be, there'll be a little bit of testing around that, but uh, the positive signs that we've gotten out of this Beta testing has been really good, so we'd love to initiate it. Also, we don't want to leave it too long to f watch the forest recovery because within about five years, most of the forest should be started to get back to to a, a state in which it's um, it was pre fire. Okay, Mitch, the next one's for you. Um, a question around if you anticipate that your app evidence will influence coastal planning and decision making. Look. Uh, I, that's my my hope. That's because that's what we try to do as as researchers. Um, I think I think it will. So we're um, at the moment coastal planning across Australia is reliant. They try and make decisions based on very limited data. So we've been monitoring one site at Collaroy Narrabeen Beach for many years, and a lot of the planning in southeast Australia is reliant just on that one beach. But we know how diverse our coastlines are. And now for the first time, we're going actually able to extend more broadly to all different sites and actually plan, understand how dynamic it varies from, site, from location to location. And then we can start to plan accordingly to make sure that we don't build in these dynamic zones. Great. Two more questions. Talia, uh, were the same individuals sampled pre and post fire? Um, we don't know who these gaps belong to at this point in time. Again, um, we do have the ability in the future to actually start developing those techniques because uh, you do get a, a decent amount of echidna DNA alongside the other types of DNA from the scats. So we're hoping to also start um, to develop some identifying um, locations in the genome so that we can actually start pinning together who belongs to who. Um, but at this point in time, we don't know exactly who the scats belong to. Okay. This last question is for all three, and we'll start maybe with Patrick and then Mitch and then Talia. Uh, what do you consider to be the most significant factors in the success of your project? I'd really love to get the, uh, the, the biggest geographic range and to make sure that every kind of all the vegetation communities are being well sampled across the whole fire fire perimeter. That'd be excellent. So if we could really get a big number of people getting involved across that whole area and then a nice time series, we'll be able to um, to figure out some really nice aspects to our um, forest recovery. Okay. Look, for, for COSNAP, I think it's it's similar issues. Yeah, um, getting as, as much spatial coverage as possible. Um, one of the things that we're really interested in, in for COSNAP now that we have um, 16 countries involved is learning more about cultural understandings of coastlines and how they vary from um, diff from country to country because that's never been looked at before. So um, that's something we never anticipated at the start that we'd be able to do because we only, <laughs> our initial focus was on the northern beaches of Sydney, but that's where, yes, yeah, that's where we're looking at now. Fantastic. And Talia? I guess to keep on this spatial theme, <laughs> um, we also, with the Kids of CSI, tend to get a lot of our data and um, material from the outer regions of Australia because that's where people live. Um, and a lot of our, most of our um, reach has come from media and social media. So uh, those are the type of communities that we're getting from. So we're trying now, especially to like put some more effort 
into getting some information from more of the centre of Australia, which um, so we're we're wanting to team up with some more rural communities and Indigenous communities to try and get that level of information. Um, but other than that, generally just getting the uh, word out about the fact that echidnas are so cool and but we're still very worried about them. They sort of just get forgotten as um, as, a, as a mammal species of, oh, they'll be fine. But it's just because we don't have the data to show that they're not fine. And so we want to get that message across a little bit better now. Terrific. Well, we're just on the hour. Um, please join me in thanking all of the speakers. Really, really tremendous talks. And thank you for all your questions. A reminder to fill out the poll that's popping up on the screen and please join us for ALA's next webinar. I think the speakers have all demonstrated that how powerful citizen science is and it can also lead to additional questions, research questions that they hadn't necessarily anticipated at the start of the project. So thank you so much, Mitch, Talia, and Patrick, and take care. Thank you.